Hello, Pastor Brian here again this morning from Mount Moriah Baptist Church in Edneyville, North Carolina. Appreciate you tuning in again today. This is uh, our second week of doing this uh, during this uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, I will continue to say this. I'm, I don't like doing this this way. Um, I'd rather have the church family together inside the building. Uh, but God has a plan, and uh, again, maybe he wants to take this time to stretch the church out, take us beyond these walls, let us reach out and show everybody in our community, county, state, around the world, uh, the love and compassion of Jesus Christ. But thank you for, uh, for tuning in. Glad you're here. Uh, just want to remind you that this Wednesday evening, uh, we will be doing our online uh, prayer meeting. We had a lot of fun with that uh, last Wednesday. Uh, got to cut up a little bit, but we also had a serious, serious prayer time. So be remembering that uh, this Wednesday at 7 p.m. Also, and uh, not to make a big deal out of this or anything, but I've had several people call me, text me messages on Facebook wanting to know about tithes. Uh, can we send in our tithes? And yes, you can. You see a uh, address at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you would like to send your tithe in, you can do that. That's fine. Uh, I'm going to ask you to please do not uh, send cash in the mail. Uh, don't do that. But if you'd like to send a check, you can do that. And um, But if you do have cash and you'd like to, to give that, just hold on until we uh, get back together. With that, and let me remind you about this virus. It will not last forever. It won't. We'll be back together soon. But in the meantime, uh, this is how we're going to do church. Uh, so uh, we're going to continue uh, this morning. Uh, words from the cross. This is part two. Um, you can uh, go on Facebook and you can see last week's or YouTube see last week's. Also, you may know someone who does not have internet access. We do have CDs, we have DVDs. If you would like that, please message us on Facebook or message me personally, and we will make sure that we get those to the people who, who need those, okay? We don't want anyone to go uh, without uh, being fed the Word of God, okay? All right, so I'm going to pray, and then we'll get into God's Word for this morning, all right? Father, we thank you. We thank you for this medium Facebook and YouTube. Thank you for the internet and allowing us to still be able to communicate and be together as a church. And thank you for using this to get your word out, not just to Mount Moriah Baptist Church, but to people around the world, Lord Father. We pray that you would just use this in a magnificent, mighty way. And Lord Father, please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to preach what you want me to preach. Lord, Father, because I am nothing without you. Help me, Father. It's in Jesus' name that I do pray. Amen. All right, let's go back. We were here last week. Let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 23. Luke 23. We're going to be looking at uh, verse 32 in just a minute. And like I say, this is part two of a short series of messages where we're examining some of the words, not all, but some of the words that Jesus spoke from the cross and what those words mean to us, okay? If you got your Bible with you or your iPad or your phone or whatever, however you access the word, let's read together Luke chapter 23, beginning at verse 32. Jesus is on the cross. The word reads, And there were also two others, malefactors or criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Let's continue reading. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him. That means they sneered at him. They made fun of him. They were glad that he was dying. And they were saying, 
He saved others. Let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss, done nothing wrong. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, here's our key verse, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Amen. Amen. What does the statement, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. What does that, that mean that he spoke 2,000 years ago? How does it affect us today in 2020? Well, I can think of at least four ways, four things, okay? Number one, this tells us, I, I love this, I love this, tells us that no one is ever too far gone to be saved. Never too far gone to be saved. Now, let's make something clear about these two men that were on either side of Jesus that day. These were not your common, everyday thieves. Uh, they were not simple shoplifters or pickpockets or burglars. The word thief here in the original Greek tells us that they were very violent offenders. They were, these were mean men. Uh, many theologians believe that these two men beside Jesus may have been in with Barabbas, the, the, the murderer, in trying to overthrow the Roman government. Today, we would call these two thieves terrorists. Bad men who would do whatever it took, kill, steal, destroy, to get what they wanted. Now, here, here's the point. One of these men went to heaven that day. No one is ever too far gone to be saved. You sitting at your house today or in your car, wherever you're at, you should say amen right there. No one is ever too far gone to be saved. You can think of the worst person you know. That, that person who, who does terrible things, who does awful things. Listen, and we think there's no hope for them. They, they, they'll, they'll never make it. No one is too far gone for Jesus to save them. Years ago, I read about a man who was an alcoholic. Just really, really bad. And... Uh, he would do whatever it took. He was a vile man who did anything he had to do to get his booze. I mean, wh whatever, steal, wh whatever it took. Well, one day, his two-year-old little boy became very ill. And without a certain medicine, the little boy would die. So the man went out and he begged for money out on the street, begging, I got a sick child, I need money, I need money. And people were hesitant because they knew this man. They knew how vile he was. But some gave because the story hurt their hearts. And he eventually got enough money. But instead of going and buying the medicine for his little boy, you guessed it, he went and bought more liquor and got drunk. His little boy died just a couple days later. At the funeral, when no one was watching, this man went up to the casket of his little boy, reached in and took the shoes off his feet, hid them under his coat and left. He went and sold those shoes for more money. Two hours later, he was staggering drunk. Now, now folks, to me, that, that, that's low. That's bad. And I would maybe look at that man and say there's no hope for him. I may look at him and say, man, he, he, he deserves 
He, he deserves what he's going to get. But that man eventually, he hit the bottom of the bottom. And he wandered into a uh, city mission. It was there that someone told him about the love, compassion, and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. That man that I'm talking about, his name is Mel Trotter. He went on to be one of the greatest preachers and evangelists and missionaries of the last century. No one is too far gone to be saved. Listen, every one of us has messed up. Every one of us has sinned. Every one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. But none of us have fallen so far that Jesus can't save us. Folks, it doesn't matter where you and I have been. It doesn't matter what you and I have done. Jesus can save us. He can save us. And, and listen to this. God accepts us just as we are. Just as we are. So many people have told me over the years. I, I've been pastoring for 20 years. So many people have said to me, Brian, I'll come to church as soon as I get my life straightened out. Or, Brian, I'll get right with God as soon as I get myself together. Friend, please, please hear what I'm about to say. When you're messed up is exactly when you need God the most. Don't wait to get straightened out. Don't let the devil lie to you and convince you that you have to be straightened out before you can come to God. The thief on the cross, he didn't get his life straightened out. He didn't clean his life up. He didn't get it all together. <laughs> but he still went to heaven that day, didn't he? He still went to heaven. Folks, I hate to think about how many people have gone to hell thinking I'll get right with God as soon as I get my life together. That's a lie. That's a lie. Think about it. Just when the thief needed God the most, God was right there beside him. When you and I need God the most, he's right there beside us. No one is ever too far gone to be saved. Number two, the second thing that we can get from Jesus' words here is this. Salvation is simple. Salvation is simple. In the book of Matthew, we're told that both of the thieves, on, when they first put them on the cross, they started out, they were, they were mocking Jesus. They were insulting him. They were yelling at him, saying things like, Hey, you're supposed to be God in the flesh. Save yourself. Save us. Do something. Just, you know, just making fun of him. But something happened to that second thief. Something happened during those hours on the cross. Maybe he saw how Jesus handled himself, how he didn't criticize those who were putting him to death, how he didn't condemn them. I mean, after all, he did say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they did. Maybe that touched that thief's heart. Perhaps he turned and looked into the eyes of God himself and saw the love and the compassion and forgiveness that God had for him. Whatever it was, whatever happened in that thief's heart that day, he believed that Jesus was the Messiah and that Jesus was dying for his sins. So he yelled to the other thief. He said, hey, we're guilty of our sins. This man is innocent. I'm guilty. He's not. Then he made a simple request. He turned to Jesus Christ. Hanging right there on the cross, this thief turned to Christ and said, remember me when you go to heaven. And Jesus replied, Today you will be with me in paradise or heaven. It's that simple. It's that simple. The thief didn't have to work for it. 
He didn't have to be good enough. He didn't have to recite a chant or anything like that. He didn't have to take classes. He didn't have to wear the right clothes, cut his hair a certain way, or put the right amount of money in the offering plate. He didn't have to do any of that. All the thief has, had to do was admit his guilt and ask Jesus to save him. That's it. Now I know someone's thinking out there, preacher, is it really that easy? I mean, that just doesn't, I mean, hey, I, I live in 2020, nothing's easy. Is it really that easy to be saved? It sure is. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us, For by grace are you saved through faith. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe he's God's son and that he died for you and that three days later he was resurrected from the dead? Do you believe that? If so, then you can be saved. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I've said it many, many times over the years. All it takes is the devil or an overeducated preacher like myself to mess up the simplicity of the gospel. Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever, you know what that word whosoever means in the original language? It means whosoever. Whosoever. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Number three. Jesus' words here tell us that entrance into heaven is immediate. Entrance into heaven is immediate. Don't you know that that thief's heart rejoiced when Jesus said, Today? Jesus didn't say, Tomorrow, or after a while, or, or someday. But he said, Today you will be with me in heaven. I love this. When Jesus said today, we can know two things for sure. Number one, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are immediately, immediately forgiven, accepted, eternally secure, and we're going to heaven. Salvation isn't something we get when we die. Salvation is something that we own right now when we accept him. And beloved, it cannot be taken away. It can't be taken away. And number two, today means that when death does come, and, and I know this is a silly statistic, but studies show that one out of every one of us will die. Okay? It's coming. All right? But today means that when death does come, there is no purgatory, there is no limbo, there is no waiting, there is no soul sleeping. Angels escort us immediately into the presence of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Let me tell you something, folks. I'm here at the church today, and I've got graveyard on three sides of me right now. That graveyard is empty. There's not a soul in it. There's not. They are all in one of two places. One of two places. Lastly, number four, Jesus' words here tell us that heaven is a very real place. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad today that heaven is real? We get our word paradise from the Greek word paradisos, which means garden or park a place of perfection, beauty, and delight. Think, think of the Garden of Eden, heaven on earth, where God, with walk, where God walked with man until sin entered in. Heaven, a beautiful, perfect place in the presence of God. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says it like this, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for us. Heaven. Heaven is a real place. You know, I can preach about a lot of things, but one thing that really piques people's interest is when you talk about heaven. You know why that is? It's because this place we're on right now, this isn't where we belong. This is not our home. Our home is in heaven. And that's why we're so interested. 
So I'm going to encourage you. I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to step away from my notes here for just a minute. I'm going to ask you. We're going to meet again this Wednesday evening. And if you have a question about heaven, what's it like? What's it going to be? What does the Bible say about this? Put it in the comments below. And Wednesday, we'll get into it. We'll talk about heaven a little bit. But folks, let me tell you this. We can't imagine how wonderful it is. And beloved, as sure as you can see me right now, heaven is that real. It's real. It's a place where we're going to be together one day as believers. There is no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more worries. Who's got worries out there today? Who's stressed out there today? Do I need to go ahead and raise my hand? <laughs> yeah. This, our, our world's turned upside down right now. Heaven's not. <laughs> Heaven's not turned upside down at all. Everybody's doing fine. Thank you very much. One day, one day, we'll be there if Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Heaven. Jesus is there. Listen to this. The thief on the cross. He's there too. He's there. So here's my question as I close today. Simple question. Will you be there? It's our choice. It's our choice. I've heard people say many times over the years, how can a loving, good God send people to hell? He doesn't. That decision's in our hands. We get to make the choice. It's up to us. The two thieves on the cross, they represent mankind just perfectly. Some will be like one thief. They will refuse to believe. They will reject Jesus Christ, they will mock him and say, oh, he's not who he says he is. And they're going to forfeit forgiveness, abundant life today, and eternal life forever. But there are others. There are some who will believe and will receive the gift of salvation from Jesus Christ. Here's the question we all have to answer. Which side of Jesus are we on? Now, I want to pray with you before we leave. I know there's somebody watching, and you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ. And remember, it's so simple. If you've never done that, just sitting right where you're at, it doesn't matter where you are around the world. No, it does not matter. I want you to just bow your head and just pray this prayer. Father God, I am a sinner. I have messed up. I have fallen. I have done wrong. But I believe that Jesus Christ, your son, died on the cross to take my sins away. I accept that free gift. I make Jesus my Lord and my Savior today. Thank you, Father, for forgiving me of my sins and for letting me become your child. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just prayed that and you meant it, according to God's word, you're saved. You have reached, gotten, received salvation from Jesus Christ. If you did that, would you mind just typing a little message down there and just say look pastor brian i accepted jesus christ today and we will continue to pray for you as you walk and grow in your faith in jesus christ folks i wish i could just keep talking and going on with you but uh david says i have to i have to wrap up now but thank you so much for tuning in today i love you i appreciate you please tune in uh, next Wednesday evening and spread the word about this let people know what's going on and again if you need a DVD CD for someone that doesn't have internet please let us know in the comments below and we'll make sure that you get that all right I love you thank you for watching and I'll see you next time